And yeah, today is um, a sort of um, discursive um, set of provisional um, proposals and conclusions, I suppose, that arises from uh, a number of uh, pieces of work that I'm, I'm working on at the moment. One is a, a research proposal to look at um, or try to deconstruct the notion of new peasantries, which would be a country-based study, including uh, Ecuador, most probably Scotland, um, uh, possibly Mexico and India at the same time. So I'm currently working on that research proposal. I'm also working on a, on a book with a couple of other uh, people, uh, revisiting um, Eric Wolf's uh, well-known work on peasant wars of the 20th century, which was published back in 1969. And we're hoping to have a book ready for next year, the 50th anniversary of, of that uh, event. Um, so that obviously that, you know, key element of that is the several to resistance. Um, and then a, a third element, I suppose, is that I have a PhD student, Elise, who's working uh, in Scotland on issues to do with food sovereignty and agroecology. Um, and some of these issues are highly pertinent to her work. And of course, I've, I've had a, an informal ongoing dialogue with Ian, our, our resident uh, expert here on matters uh, Scottish and more particularly uh, uh, Gaelic. So I'm probably uh, sticking my neck out uh, to some extent in actually <laughs> having the temerity to address uh, anything to do with Scotland at all. So no doubt I'll, I'll get, uh, get my head bitten off for that in due course. But anyway, these are some provisional uh, thoughts and, and discussion points, really, and, and hopefully points of uh, dialogue between what seems sometimes to be something of a, a dichotomy or a dualism between matters of class uh, on the one hand and matters of cultural identity, ethnicity, or post-coloniality on the other. So I suppose this is an attempt to um, introduce, not introduce, but actually look at the ways in which we can free, fruitfully uh, think about these two issues in, in dialogue and um, either, either aspect can gain from engagement with the other. And there, it's, it's a dialectical relationship, it's not, they're not two separate entities, it's simply artificially come together, it's actually seeing how each moulds the other, I think. Um, so what I want to do really is focus on this issue of the birth of capitalism and the relative end of the peasantry uh, and this process of so-called primitive accumulation that um, Marx termed um, as primitive accumulation in the sense that it was prime or first um, event of capitalist accumulation. It, it, was, a, it was a premise on, upon which capitalism was based uh, in conscious opposition to the work of Adam Smith, who saw capitalism as arising as much more of a linear process arising from accumulation of mercantile wealth, whereas Marx saw it much more in terms of change, fundamentally changed social relationships. Uh, one of the most important of which was the expropriation of the peasantry uh, from their customary access to the means of production or partial expropriation. So, yes, what is it then? So, the process whereby peasantries and or indigenous people, this process of expropriation being deprived of customary access to land, either fully or partially, both from cultivated land, that is in, traditionally in-field systems, uh, where land was ploughed up and planted with arable crops, and additionally, uh, land without the enclosed in-field systems, uh, that is what was generally called in the medieval times uh, the memorial waste, which uh, formed an essential part of the economy of, of peasant people through grazing systems, uh, gathering fuel, turves, and a whole host of other, other use values for people. Um, so this was a, a, a political act. I mean, it, was a, it was a deliberate act rather than a, in, an ineluctable and inevitable process, as the neoclassicists would like us 
to believe, or indeed as Adam Smith would have liked us to believe. It was a, it's a political or class act of expropriation undertaken by what was essentially a new class of capitalist landlords, particularly in, in the case of Britain, where you had that classic uh, tripartite structure emerging of the uh, aristocratic landlords at the top, uh, new class of tenant farmers, capitalist farmers below, and a new class of landless laborers beneath. Um, elsewhere, of course, it wasn't quite so extreme. Uh, in much of Europe, it was much more of a state-managed uh, process, of course. But in this country, in Britain, uh, the state was certainly there uh, to reinforce uh, and actually structure these new property relations. So in essence, then, this political process creates a new class of se proletarians or semi-proletarians, where the peasantry are not completely divorced from their land, they still have some links to land, but typically uh, the land is insufficient to keep a family going throughout the year. Uh, there can be differentiation within the peasantry, of course, you can have a new class of upper peasantry who become small commercial farmers, a middle class of peasantry who are more or less self-sufficient, and then the semi-proletarian or lower peasantries who cannot survive on the basis of agricultural production alone. They have to sell their labour, either in the, in the countryside or, or in the city. Uh, so this emerged essentially out of feudal relations of production. So why is, why is this of significance? Well, it, it marks, it's a crucial marker of the advent of, of capitalism. Um, it generates this phenomenon of market dependence. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the work of Ellen uh, Meekson's Wood, uh, a political Marxist uh, scholar, who um, introduced the notion of market uh, dependence. That is the compulsion to depend on a competitive market for the reproduction either of, of the worker, so workers have to compete with other workers in order to access work and means of production, and of course as a capitalist him or herself who has to compete with other capitalists in order to survive in a competitive marketplace. Uh, so there is no absolute right um, to, to um, the means of production, you have to compete for that right. Um, so that entails the dominance of absolute private uh, property rights. If you are lucky enough to access the means of production, you have absolute rights over them. You can decide what to do. And others have no rights over that particular land. It becomes an alienable commodity, in essence, therefore. Uh, there is a compulsive imperative of competition among producers, both workers and capitalists. Um, under capitalism, characteristically, we tend for the first time to have the actual constitution of what we call an economy. A separate economy didn't exist essentially before the advent of capitalism. So you have categories such as the economy and the polity being new institutional domains. Because in feudalism, in, in, in pre capitalist modes of production, modes of domination, access to the means of production is controlled by political means. Under capitalism, access to the means of production is controlled principally through the market. So this, this, this is a clear disjunction from feudal and other modes of production through to capitalism. And we have the predominance of exchange value over use value. And the surplus value extracted from laborers um, is contained in the commodities that are actually sold on the market. And of course, something that has not necessarily been emphasized by more traditional Marxist scholars are the cultural aspects of this whole process. Although there are plenty of Marxists who have emphasized it, mostly cultural uh, historians and others, uh, E.P. Thompson, Antonio Gramsci, Eric Wolf, and many, uh, many others, have emphasized the processes of alienation, cultural deracination, cognitive dissonance, etc., that is entailed in that process from moving from a, a morally based economy or a politically based economy, if you will, 
to something that is determined by the much, the much greater abstraction of market forces. Um, and there have been a number of marvellous books written on the, these more cultural aspects, one of which is that by Michael Tausi, written back in the 1970s, about the experience of Colombian uh, peasants going from a feudal uh, system through into a more capitalistically based system, entitled The Devil and Commodity Fetishism. So an important aspect, the whole aspect of this is how subalterns actually understand this process themselves. So we have a, a both, as it were, a more structural, material or objective process going on on the one hand, and the more subjective cultural uh, internalization. How, how is this process understood by the agents themselves, um, most particularly by subalterns? And of course that plays in importantly as to how um, resistance is forthcoming, or the absence of resistance. So there, those, are, those are key issues, really. Um, now, primitive accumulation, uh, differentiated responses in the global north and the global south. Now, this is a very crude division, but it nevertheless does hold a kernel, probably more than a kernel of truth. And when I'm referring to the global north, I'm referring to Western Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, etc. Those met basically members of the OECD countries, um, the, the imperial countries in, es in essence. And the south, global south, is virtually everything else, although obviously in the current conjuncture, countries like China most particularly have emerged from, from those ranks and have asserted their, their own rights within the capitalist system, as it were. So the crucial step in the emergence of, a, of capitalist, fully capitalist relations, as I've suggested, is this process of expropriation or dispossession. Uh, now in the global north, it has tended to be the case since this process first emerged uh, in the 18th century, or in the late 18th century, and particularly in the 19th century through into the 20th centuries, that subaltern resistance has been relatively temporary and has tended to be absorbed or co-opted into the dominant capitalist system through a series of safety valves, as it were. Um, one of which is alternative, relatively secure employment, uh, most particularly in, in industry. Um, so expropriation is compensated for by migration into relatively secure employment. Um, within the agrarian sector, the creation of a, a new class of family farms, if you will, which is quite a, a dominant trend in Western Europe, and also initially in North America, of course, although it's been subverted uh, progressively, and uh, neoliberalism. Um, emigration, of course, uh, outside from Europe to other parts of the world, most particularly North America, um, Australia, New Zealand, also to South America to some degree, was also a safety valve. And of course, that in itself entailed the further expropriation of land from um, indigenous people in those parts of the world who were recipients of those emigrants. So they had suffered expropriation, the emigrants, and they in turn, uh, induced a process of further <laughs> expropriation uh, in the lands that they, they went to. Um, nationalism, of course, is an important way of actually aligning uh, class. Um, if, if there is nationalist unity, uh, the identification with people or nation that uh, is, is uh, given prime position ahead of class issues, that is, a powerful way of diffusing um, class tensions, of course. And that has indeed been a very important mechanism, particularly in the global north, through um, national imperialism or social imperialism, because obviously the imperial countries have used the global south as a, as a source of both of cheap labor and resources actually to feed capitalist growth in the core countries themselves thereby um, generating effectively um, enhanced consumption in those centers. And this integration into consumerism constitutes a powerful 
uh, safety valve while it, while it lasts. But has this ever been the case in the global south? Um, so it's, uh, one can argue that no, it hasn't been, except for very brief periods of time and with the possible exception today of, of, of China. So one can say that it's the obstructional reversal of this process of primitive accumulation uh, that comprises the absolutely key demand and desire of a large number of counter-hegemonic peasant forces in the global south today, particularly under conditions of neoliberalism, where there is no longer, even if there ever were, secure employment in urban centres, uh, let alone in the countryside. So there, there is this double squeeze. Peasants don't have sufficient access to land on their own small plots. They can't find adequate employment in the towns or elsewhere in the countryside. Um, the options for migration are closing down rapidly. Witness Trumpism in the US, which was a massive safety valve for the peasantry much of, much of Mexico, Central America and beyond, that, that was being closed down. So the closure of that safety valve means that those contradictions, that demand for the means of production, begins to come back home and begins to induce massive pressures on, on the state at home. Um, so increasing demand under neoliberalism, uh, there was a brief window of Keynesianism uh, where there was an attempt to generate nationally based capitalist production back in the, from the 60s, 50s, 60s and 70s. That disappeared with neoliberalism, has had a slight resurgence under the new um, peak wave regimes in Latin America, but now seems to be unraveling again. So there is still this uh, massive demand for land on the part of the peasants who have never had adequate access to land. And this is particularly on the part of the middle and lower peasantries. Okay, class analysis with material and discursive dimensions. So I'm suggesting that this process of primitive accumulation, this transition from feudalism to capitalism, cannot be understood without recourse to the sort of analysis that I've just presented to you, as essentially a class of political analysis, surrounding the definition of and resistance to these new material um, relations on the one hand, but of course, these are, these are mediated through uh, discursive power relations at the same time. The two go hand in hand. So the social property relations are based both in the control of resources, land, on the one hand, and of course in the ideological control over subalterns on the other, which includes, of course, the self-conceptualization of subalterns themselves of that particular process. So power as class relations is exercised both through property power, as, as Rowan Lubbock in an earlier seminar back in April was suggesting. Uh, property power, on the one hand, and this stems from the work of people like Foucault and, uh, and Jean Bidet, uh, French thinkers, and knowledge power. So Marx tended to be focused differentially on property power, while as people like Foucault tend differentially to be focused on knowledge power. But in fact, the two are complementary, they're, they're dialectically related. So property power can't really be reduced, reproduced without knowledge power. Now under capitalism, these two things do tend to be relatively institutionally separated out between the capitalist who has absolute power over, over property and so the knowledge power aspects tend to be differentially located with, with the state to reproduce an ideology of uh, worker subordination or conformity to capitalist uh, um, uh, norms. So this bridge from material class position, as it were, to discursive, discursive class positionality, this more subjective understanding of this process, 
is really the issue of political class formation, class consciousness, and the role of ideology in shaping class and resistance to modes of exploitation as they're actually experienced by, by, by people, by subalterns. So the one cannot automatically be read from the other, as a lot of orthodox Marxists have asserted. You said the right. So if, if these are objective conditions, then we can simply take it as read that somehow subalterns will you know, adopt um, you know, a, a proletarian view on this thing. It, it's, not, it's not a simple process like that. There are other mediating circumstances that one has to, has to go through. And of course, ethnicities, aspects of, such as ethnicity, race, gender, religion, etc., are often an important factor shaping how class and power relations are actually defined and experienced. So class can be simultaneously defined in terms of ethnicity or race. One only needs to think, for example, of slavery, which often cuts along racial lines, but of course is at the same time a class relation. It's a relation of exploitation. It's not that you're exploiting people for the sake of their being of color, for example. It's because you want their surplus labor. But the reason for doing that, the legitimating basis for doing that can be asserted on the basis that other people have different colored skins or whatever, or speak a different language or have a different religion. So depending on particular circumstances, class exploitation, power relations more generally, and I use class as a shorthand for these more general power relations, may be defined, in other words, used as a marker and legitimated, that is justified, by the exploiters in terms of these categories, such as ethnicity, or race, or gender, or religion. We think of the island in Ireland, for example, Catholics have tended to be uh, exploited by Protestants, so it cuts along religious lines, and it does often elsewhere. So you just need, need a marker as a justification for a, a system of exploitation, which is nonetheless a class relation. And of course, at the same time, if, 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 that, if that marker does function as such, as a basis for exploitation, then that marker will be felt by the exploited themselves as a basis for discrimination. So class exploitation as power relations may be defined and resisted by the exploited precisely in terms of ethnicity or race or gender or religion, etc. So there's, a, there's obviously a dialectic between those two sides of the same coin. So I'm suggesting that rather than a binary of class reductionism, which is tended to be advocated by more orthodox Marxists, the material on the one hand, as it were, versus what might be called the cultural essentialism, and I'm probably being a bit um, simplistic here, um, the discursive, but for the purposes of argument, I'm, I'm making a point, I, I want to explore the proposition that class and ethnicity and or race, gender, religion, etc., may often be combined in the imposition of and resistances to capitalist power relations. Now, before I start looking at, at Scotland, getting my head uh, bitten off, I just wanted to say a bit more about the extirpation of common rights, uh, which is one of the fund fundamental aspects of the transition from feudal or, or pre-capitalist modes of exploitation through to capitalism itself, because we're after, we're after all looking at the exclusive property rights and the extirpation of common rights to land. So capitalism is generally associated with private property rights, enforced, of course, by the state. The state has an essential role in backing up those claims to absolute property, and it will do so by force, and it has done so you know, very, very frequently in the face of resistance. So this means that exclusive rights to ownership of a piece of land also give exclusive rights of use. No one else has a legal right to use the land. It's determined by the market. So if you can't make it in the market, you face losing that piece of land at the same time. Um, 
Now, in the preceding feudal mode and other modes from which capitalism emerged, in, in, in Britain certainly and up throughout much of Western Europe, most land was subject to common property rights. Uh, most land was, of course, owned by lords, but, the, but that ownership came with um, the rights of others to use the land in some respect, even though they were subordinate and the lord had absolute right over that piece of land. So that right of ownership by feudal lords did not give exclusive rights of use. Other people living in the community usually had specific rights to use that land in certain ways. Now, it's, it's a general popular misconception that commons or common land belong to no one, to the general public or to the inhabitants of the village. Now, that has never been the case in this, in this country, certainly in a lot of other countries. It, it is the case, indeed, in egalitarian systems and order tribal systems where there is common access to land. But in hierarchical systems, that generally is not the case. It's just that the peasants or lower classes still have certain rights of use to land, but the ultimate control is exerted by those in power. And this is an important, a vitally important point because it was that power vested in the feudal lords which enabled them to assert those absolute property rights which emerged with, with capitalism. So that, that, that's an absolutely vital point that is often not appreciated. And people look back at the feudal past and think, well, that was a halcyon period of common ownership of land. It wasn't at all. Uh, it may have been originally right back in certain periods of the Anglo-Saxon world when peasants did have much more rights and they, the, the, Lord, the, the authority of the Lord was much less clearly asserted. But that was a long, long time ago. And of course, the power of the lords was massively reinforced with the advent of the Normans as well. And there, interestingly enough, with the advent of the Normans, uh, the Normans became the overclass, and the Anglo-Saxons became, generally speaking, the underclass. And there you have a, an interesting case of a peasant, of, of cla a class relationship defined on ethnic and cultural lines again. But that gradually disappeared during the course of the medieval period. Uh, right, now, primitive accumulation in Scotland. Now, is, it, is, uh, is this the same process throughout Scotland? But there are differentiated uh, responses between the lowlands, and when I say the highlands, I don't, I don't mean the highlands as a whole, I'm really referring to the Western Highlands and the islands. Um, a, a, a broad uh, categorization used by lots of others, uh, uh, to, uh, Tom uh, Levine there. So I'm not talking about the Highlands in, in general there. Um, now I think it can be fairly convincingly argued that primitive accumulation has transition to capitalism and the expropriation of the majority of the peasantry from their means of production um, occur throughout Scotland from the late 17th, but particularly from about 1750 onwards to the latter part of the 19th centuries. An essential shift from feudal or quasi-feudal, and, and there probably is a slight differentiation there from areas outside the Western Highlands and, and Islands, where you have a more patrimonial system probably than, than a purely feudal system. I may, I may be wrong, the only one to correct me. Um, but nonetheless, either feudal or quasi-feudal system. And this entailed the lords or lairds um, essentially terminating the common rights of, of the peasantry and the granting of the great bulk of land as a consequence to a new class of capitalist tenantry. Um, so they, they retain their position as lairds at the top. They let their lands to a relatively small class of tenants who competed on the market to actually gain access to those tenancies. Uh, so they obliged to bid competitively for tenancies and who moreover had to produce competitively for a new capitalist market. If they didn't do so, 
their, their, their tenancy could be um, concluded at the end of its term or even, even before, and another tenant could be um, uh, put in their place who could do the job of the capitalist more effectively. Now, there were lowland clearances, although that's not widely known, but there's a, there's a lot of nice little book written in more popular they you know. Lowland clearances, the Scotland Silent Revolution. Um, because uh, sequentially it, it occurred before that, uh, the transition to capitalism in much of the highlands, Western highlands and islands, starting typically in, in the later 17th century. Uh, but also, I think crucially, according to, to my reading, anyway, apart from relatively early on and isolated resistances, it didn't seem to engender uh, subaltern resistance to nearly the same degree as occurred in the Western Islands and Islands. So what, what is the basis for this differentiation if the processes of emergence of capitalism were structurally relatively similar in the two areas? So to take, take the lowland Scotland first, crucially, there are a series of safety valves, I see, in the form of, obviously, the emergence of, of capitalist industry. So you, you had a convenient dialectic between expropriation of their own populations and the simultaneous growth of industry, particularly in, in, uh, in the Scottish Lowlands, and when I when I refer to the lowlands, I'm actually confusingly incorporating, including the Scottish uplands area. So this is the up, this, the, the um, southern uplands, and what's usually referred to as the lowlands, the central lowland belt, and, and the southern uplands is here the lowlands. Okay. Um, so this this process of the emergence of capitalist agriculture emerged in the late uh, 17th century in the southern uplands and the Lowland uh, Belt, and really took off from about 1750. But it coincided with a series of, of safety valves, which would have uh, diffused, to some degree, or largely, um, subaltern resistance. There was also employment in agriculture, because agriculture was still, albeit capitalist, relatively diverse. It was a mixed pastoral uh, arable system. And there are more um, employment opportunities in, in agriculture itself than the more purely pastoral um, highlands, where, of course, you had a transition from diverse agricultural systems through to virtual monoculture of sheep uh, grazing, with relatively few employment opportunities as a consequence. The new capitalist tenantry uh, in the, in the uh, lowland, the central belt, and the southern uplands was generally speaking recruited in the main from local populations. So there had already been a process of differentiation amongst the peasantry into lower and upper peasantry. And the new tenancies generally went to members of the upper, upper peasantry. So there wasn't a disjuncture, therefore, in, between the lo local population and people coming in from, from outside. These were people who'd grown up lived and knew other people in, in that particular environment. There was also a process of very large-scale immigration from this area as well, uh, which actually was, in, in, um, in, in sheer population terms, was significantly larger than that, which occurred in, in absolute terms, uh, than occurred uh, in, in the Highlands. Ian may want me to correct me on that one, but it was very, very significant, and large numbers of people did actually immigrate to North America and elsewhere, so that was another safety belt. And the, uh, and the cultural aspect of it as well is, of course, vitally important. We're not dealing with uh, Gallic culture, Gallic-speaking people here. We're, talking, we're dealing with lowland Scots, who were basically, the lairds were culturally basically the same as, as, uh, uh, as the peasants. Uh, which, of course, they were actually in the highlands, but the crucial difference, as I will suggest there, is that the Laird's adopted a capitalist mentality in contradistinction to what was construed to be associated with another mode of production, 
uh, um, pre-capitalist mode of production, which became associated with things gathering. That was not the case uh, in, in, in the lowlands. So there, are, there, there weren't those clear cultural markers uh, in this case that there were uh, in the western highlands and islands. So sorry, this is a, this is a little bit small, but anyway, primitive accumulation basically referring to the um, western highlands and islands. The peasantry below a category of um, people known as, as tax men who were, who were essentially um, a, a stratum below the lairds themselves who mediated uh, relations between the lairds and what one might structurally call the peasantry, although I know Ian has severe problems with that term, but um, who basically uh, collected rents, etc., and also had a, a very important military uh, function because the Western Highlands and Islands were a, a vitally important source of men for the military, uh, for, the, for the British state. So there are various um, um, not strictly economic roles that these, these taxmen actually played. So then the, the peasantry, as it were, below the level of taxmen, had no direct face with, with the market until relatively late on, unlike the peasantries in the lowlands. So there was a very, relatively little differentiation amongst the so-called uh, peasantry, the Gallic uh, peasantry. Uh, so non-economic, uh, quasi-feudal, feudal, uh, paternalistic relations between the peasantry and then until relatively late on, which began to unravel uh, really uh, the later uh, 18th century. Populations were removed wholesale, and this, this, is, this is another uh, factor, of course, um, that a lot of the inland areas were completely or virtually completely depopulated by the clearances from inland settlements and a significant number of people, those who didn't emigrate, were resettled in coastal areas on very small plots of land. Um, primarily because the most lucrative employment for these people at the time was in, in the kelp uh, industry, which was booming in the late 18th and through into the early 19th century. So these people could be uh, productively employed. They were semi proletarians because they never had enough land in their new crofts on the coast actually to provide um, full um, remuneration throughout, throughout the year. So they were obliged actually to sell their labour to the land and work in these cattle industries. And another factor, of course, in the ability to survive on these tiny plots of land was the introduction of a potato, which was highly productive, of course, and could be fertilised by, by um, seaweed and kelp, etc. It was highly productive and could, could sustain relatively large populations on very poor uh, land over a very small area. Um, and outside the Kelping, the land was generally speaking turned over to, to sheep by, by the new capitalist uh, lairds. Um, and, the, and again, the new class of capitalist uh, tenants tended to be recruited from outside the area. So they were either from elsewhere in Scotland or they were even English. They were generally not, not Gaelic speakers. So there was a, you could see a distinct cult, cultural difference emerging, therefore, between uh, the new expropriated and partially expropriated peasantry on the one hand and these new foreign tenants on the, on the other. The lairds themselves were, of course, um, they, they had been in place, generally speaking, for some time. They were, they were Gallic people, although culturally, they, of course, had become heavily anglicised. Uh, but there were still strong bonds between um, the peasant classes and the lairds themselves. This changed in the course of the 19th century as the free market got going and lands were exchanged and sold, etc. But initially, uh, the lairds were still, generally speaking, a Gallic. Um, now, the collapse of the kelp industry and few employment opportunities in the cheap, new sheep economy meant lack of economic alternatives. Uh, of course, potato blight struck the area 
uh, from the 1840s and caused severe famine and privation uh, for people. Um, so generally, lack of safety bills, continuing attachment to land as semi-proletarians, in contradistinction to the case in the lowlands, uh, where people, generally speaking, didn't hang on to land for very long, although there was an initial trend towards establishment of small, uh, croft-like uh, um, estate settlements initially. Um, but of course, the Gallic language and culture became associated as a, in this process with things old, non-capitalistic, almost ir irrational, while the English language, of course, and um, capitalist culture became associated with improvement and modernity. So Gallic came to be denigrated, and when resistance occurred, could be associated with sedition and actively suppressed. And so this situation of lack, relative lack of safety valves led to increasing resistance and calls for the restitution of land as the 19th century um, um, passed on, and this was in part secured via crofting legislation in the latter part of the 19th century, uh, particularly as these lack of alternatives within the area uh, in a situation of agrarian economic decline and decline of land lordship um, increased the potential power of subaltern resistance and eventuated in uh, crofting legislation and the partial restitution of lands to, to people um, in the latter part of the uh, 19th century. So the implications for this issue of class and relations between class and ethnicity. We can see hopefully that primitive accumulation is a class-based transformation in social property relations from feudalism to capitalism. But one which is deeply Overdetermined, as it were, to use an Althusserian phrase, in the Western Highlands and Islands, uh, particularly by the loss of and attacks on Gallic language, culture, identity, and indeed a whole way of life associated <coughs> with essentially a non market based moral economy, if you like. And this deepened sense of alienation, cognitive dissonance experienced by Gallic subalterns vis-à-vis -vis their non-Gallic counterparts with the advent of, of capitalism. But I, I suggest that this cultural um, understanding of this process, or cultural manifestations of this process, can't really be understood separately from the changing power and social property relations which, after all, underlay um, the, the whole process. So I, I believe we can forge an enriched understanding of this process by, by drawing upon both aspects in, in dialectical interval. So that's, uh, yes, um, <laughs> I'm running, uh, probably running out of time. But anyway, to move on to uh, Ecuador, now, Ecuador has certain similarities uh, with, with Scotland in as much as we have, or particularly the Western Highlands and Islands, in as much as we have the survival of a semi-proletarian class of, uh, of peasantry who now are clamouring for uh, million access to land. It takes a rather different form from um, Gallic resistance in a sense because because uh, Scotland is a, is a developed nation, as I suggested earlier, there are whole aspects of new safety bells that come into play, which tend to dull the assertion of, of adequate rights to land, although that obviously is an emergent phenomenon in, in Scotland. But it, 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 it's much more to the fore in a country like Ecuador, where there are simply no alternative employment opportunities for people. You know, land is the most obvious source of you know, a, ba a basis of the means of production. Anyway, to look very briefly at the pre-Columbian uh, situation. So before the advent of the Incan Empire, um, Tawantinsuyu, 
which actually uh, spread north to, to what is now Ecuador only a few years before the Spanish arrived. Um, we had what um, could be called kin ordered chieftain type uh, social systems in, in the Andes. Um, now, the, the Incan Empire itself may be characterized as an Asiatic mode of production. If you want a greater explication of these terms, I'd recommend reading Eric Wolf, Europe and the People of Art History, uh, published back in 1982, but still a marvelous uh, piece of work, well worth reading. Uh, so essentially, this was characterized by the extraction of surplus labor or produce uh, by a class of lords, uh, Incan, Incan aristocrats, who in turn, of course, offered uh, protection status and, and the beneficence of the gods, without which, of course, agricultural production couldn't actually occur. So they were, they were essential mediators of the ability of the earth to supply nourishment. Um, so the Andean region of Ecuador was characterized by hierarchy and class uh, even before the Spanish arrived. Uh, with the exception, of course, of the Amazon area, where you had egalitarian tribal systems. Um, tribal chiefs had a very, very tenuous uh, position that could easily be removed. There was no longer term security of, of class in those situations. And so what happened when the Spanish arrived was essentially they, they, they honed in on the apex of the class pyramid. They, they toppled the, the upper layer, they displaced the upper layer, and set themselves up where the, where the Incan aristocrats had been previously. Um, and the, the, the Spanish crown granted, granted to uh, the, the conquerors or aristocracy, um, the Spanish aristocracy, uh, encomiendas. They were, they were commended to uh, certain uh, Spanish privileged. Uh, people. Um, so you can see quite clearly that the new class of feudal overlords were Spanish or criollos, who those Spaniards who were actually born in the New World, the Creoles, uh, became the new landlords. They were defined ethnically by their Spanish origin, whereas the other classes were defined by their status as Native Americans. And there were intermediaries of mixed blood, the Mesisos, uh, who acted as intermediaries and fun as functions between the aristocratic, aristocratic Spanish, the peasant Native Americans. Uh, and this. Okay. So from feudalism to capitalism, uh, Ecuador was essentially dominated by these feudal relations, uh, by a system of large um, agricultural holdings called haciendas, owned by descendants of Spanish invaders, the Criollos, um, and worked by a class of Native American peasantry, peons or campesinos. Um, now these the peasants basically held very small plots of land, um, and the the landlords very graciously. Um, allowed them to have these small plots of land in return for labor service on, on, on the agricultural estate of the Lord himself. How gracious is that? Yeah. Um, and they were, th this relationship was, was called Wazibunga. Uh, there are lots of different Latin American uh, terms for it, but in Ecuador, in the central Andes, it essentially referred to as Wazibunga. Um, now, the, Capitalism emerged really in Ecuador from the 1920s and 30s. It's quite late coming into, into the country. And feudal relations held sway, quasi-feudal relations held sway really until the 1960s. There was a progressive commercialization of relations between landlord and, and uh, peasants from the 1920s through to this time, but increasing unrest really generated um, attempts at serious land reform from the 1960s. But this was really a process of agricultural modernization. Uh, it only really um, made available these small plots of land to the peasantry and the landlords held on to the bulk of their, their estates, which they then modernized and they became capitalist landowners. 
19th century. And the peasantry became semi proletarians, they worked their own little bits of land for subsistence to produce as much as they could, and then they sold their labor on the estate or they worked part time in the cities or, or where, wherever. So their demand, the, land, the demand by the peasantry for adequate land for subsistence was not met by land reform. And that is a grievance that has continued down to the present day. Um, and this coincided, this land reform process coincided with the period of Keynesian developmentalism, uh, supported by the US and the World Bank. And then, as we all know, that began to unravel during the course of the 1980s with the advent of neoliberalism. And land reform was definitely off the agenda. Then it was the market was, was to determine all. Uh, the peasant resistance, of course, continued. And um, there were various moves to try, to try and absorb and deflect uh, peasant uh, subaltern resistance to this process. And one aspect of that was the introduction of ethno, so-called ethno-development, following integrated rural development in the, in the 1980s. We have a turn to the so-called ethno-development, uh, most particularly a program called uh, Prodepine, Proyecto de Desarrollo para los Pueblos Indígenas de Nicolás de Ecuador. Um, uh, so, IRD and ethno development were only partially successful in their own terms and ultimately ineffective in dampening unrest over the impacts of, impacts of neoliberalism and partial land reform. And we have this massive peasant stroke indigenous backlash culminating in the famous, now famous uh, Levantamientos, which started in 1990, massive uh, uprising coordinated by uh, various uh, campesino and indigenous organizations, which was unprecedented, almost unprecedented in Latin America. And people couldn't believe this was actually happening in, in Ecuador. Um, so, under, under the conditions of neoliberal precarity, etc., lack of employment, lack of safety belt, this was a renewed challenge on the part of the campesinos, the indigenous people, against the process of primitive accumulation. Their demand for land had not been met, and they, want, they wanted it met. Um, so primitive accumulation is in fact being questioned and identified as the source of their precarity. And so subaltern resistance has simultaneously both class and indigenous uh, dimensions. In fact, this differentiation between class and ethnic indigenous concerns emerged really only in the 1980s with, with neoliberalism. If you actually look at the history of uh, leftist and indigenous resistance in Ecuador, you can see that there is actually a very, very close uh, interdigitation of the two concerns. That the indigenous resistance was associated uh, with, with socialism and leftist activity from the 1920s onwards. And in, interestingly, there's some, there's some very good literature on this, one of which is Mark Becker's Pachacuti uh, and various other books. It's very interesting. But it's interesting, this differentiation uh, of, of class and ethnicity seemed only really to emerge in, in Ecuador in the 1980s, and particularly in the 1990s, uh, un, under neoliberalism, uh, with programs such as uh, Pro Depine, which is an attempt to achieve um, uh, advances for the population on a purely ethnically defined basis rather than addressing the class basis of their marginalization. Okay. So, fusion of class and ethnic perspectives. Now, CONAI, um, the Confederación Nacional de los Indígenas de Ecuador, the umbrella group for Ecuadorian indigenous organizations, has stated, uh, and CONAI is a very strong advocate of this fusion of class and indigenous perspectives. It's indispensable to unite the double dimension of our struggle through recognition of the double character of our problems as members of a class and as part of different indigenous nationalities. 
So it, it does represent a successful fusion of class and ethnic perspectives, declaring itself to be an organization that is an organization of oppressed and exploited people, and its struggle is anti-colonial, it's anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist. So it should acquire this double dimension of organization, both on a class basis, together with other popular movements to transform society, as well as independent ethnic organizations. So is this, this, there is this call for uh, indigenous culture, plurinationality, running alongside this identification of class issues and the basic, the basic structural parameters of the problem. Okay. So moreover, this umbrella organization uh, is focused on challenging and reversing uh, primitive accumulation. And one of its most eloquent spokespeople, Luis Macas, an ex-president of Conaye, uh, following in the footsteps of Jose Carlos Mariategui, who was a great indigenous uh, Marxist scholar, a Peruvian Marxist indigenous scholar of the 1920s and 30s, and I recommend his work, uh, stated there will be no solution to the indigenous problem unless there is a solution to the land problem. So this is a, this is a direct confrontation with the process of, la of expropriation from land. And it's noticed mostly that indigenous communities' land, of course, is not only a means of production, a more reductive materialist interpretation, but of course, at the same time, is a fundamental base for our culture and way of life, a more culturalistic understanding. And the two, the two are complementary. So this points towards a more embracing concept for a different way of living, subverting capitalism and primitive accumulation that I, in my book, at any rate, have termed livelihood sovereignty. And it's interesting that my understanding of livelihood sovereignty has strong parallels with the Quechua understanding of uh, Sumac Kausai. Um, so the goal of or Buen Vivir, Vivir Bien, as it's been called in Spanish, the goal of the economic system argues Conay should not be profit but human welfare. So this is a big shift, shift from an obsession with the realization of exchange value to the production of use values for everyone, not mediated by the need to generate profit. Um, so, I mean, there's a huge and very rich vein, obviously, of, um, of uh, quotes that one could draw upon here. Um, so, again, Sumac Kamsa accentuates collective interests of indigenous and Afro Ecuadorian communities, as well as the rest of society. Now, just a few words about the current impasse and the prospects for this, because as you probably know, under the regime, I'm sorry, I'm, I've run over time, way over time, but um, the, the Levantamientos did help the populist regimes of Korea and Bolivia Morales to power. They were a very, very important political element in the rise to power of the so-called pink tide in those two countries. But unfortunately, these populist regimes have based their success upon what's called neo-extractivism, basically extracting oil, minerals, um, agro-export systems to generate the foreign exchange, which they then recycle into welfare and social welfare payments for um, the deprived, the subaltern elements in society. So that is as it were, a, a, a relatively effective way of co-opting certain elements of resistance. Here you are, these are the benefits of consumerism. We can integrate you into capitalist society. We welcome you to the world of consumption. Um, so there has been a divide and rule tactic by, by these populist regimes. So this is going on in Bolivia and, and in Ecuador. Um, and it's conjuncture really that can go on only so long as you can continue to extract unsustainably the resources 
or as long as people don't actually rise up in you know, sufficient force actually to put a stop to it, or the Chinese economy goes, goes down the tube, because it's all being led by the Chinese economic miracle, essentially. Um, and in, Ecuador is a microcosm of global capitalism, because what you have in one country, so that you could say Amazonia is the global south, you're extracting all these materials, unsustainably destroying ways of life, ruining biodiversity, destroying soil, etc., polluting the atmosphere. The benefits are going to a growing middle class and they need to live in the Andes primarily, so on the coast. So that is a sort of microcosm of the global north. Um, all, all this process coming together in one relatively small country. Um, but we know this is profoundly unsustainable. How long can it go on? Can go on for the issue of primitive accumulation has not been uh, addressed or redressed. There is still land poverty. There is still high levels of precarity. What is the solution to that problem? Okay. Will there be a massive resurgence of subaltern resistance, which in the last few years, in the last decade? has largely been subverted by the populism of Korea and the islands. So I'll leave you with that dilemma. Thank you very much for your attention, and my apologies for going way, way over time. Thank you very much.